ending on time. We need to start on time too, mm. right? We, and look, we're two minutes late. Good thing we're not under the law, Henry. Mm. Thank you, Lord, for this day. <laughs> Thank you for the fun and joy that we can all have together. Bless your word this morning as we look for you, Lord, in, in what you have to say to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I want to say again, I want to say thank you for Rich, because like I said a little bit last week when I was sharing my testimony, I shared how, how Ed was at my other church and how he was the head of the board and how he kept putting me into positions of, of youth ministry and uh, Royal Ranger, inviting me into Royal Ranger. They even asked me to be on the board at one time and I didn't want to be on the board, you know, so I, I, was, I didn't feel that was my calling at that time. So I just, you know, so, and, um, and he put me into the adult Bible class and connect groups. And he kept putting me in all these positions. I told him what I was sharing last week, what I didn't really touch on because I was on a roll and I was running it. Thank you for that. Is that I see Rich is like what Ed was to me there. Mm -hmm. I see mm -hmm. Rich is to me here. And um, I really appreciate that because everybody needs somebody who really has fa all faith in you. Even when the Bible says when we're faithless, he remains faithful. And so it's, you know, it's not so much our faithful, it's, it's not so much our faith as much as somebody having faith in you, you know, and you know that God, like with Job, it was amazing that Job put him on front street having, it, we talk about having faith in God, but when you look at the story of Job, God had faith in Job to even put him out there on front street and say, hey, Satan, have you considered my servant Job? <laughs> what about him? He's solid, you know? He, this is a faith guy right here. He's, you know, you, you know, I'll, you know, he says, oh, yeah, well, he loves you, you know, because you've blessed him so much. But let me put the screws to him and he will curse you to your face, Mr. God. And God says, OK, but upon his body, you can touch what he loves, but you can't touch him. Yeah. He put a restriction. And then later on, when he, you know, did, took away all the things that he loves, his money, his family and all these things, uh, he comes back and then God gives him a little more leeway and says, okay, well, he says, well, you wouldn't let me touch his body. You let me touch him, he'll curse you to your face. And he says, okay, well, you could touch him, but you can't kill him. Yeah. Constant restrictions on how far the devil could go. He did touch him with yeah. boils and, you know, he really afflict, afflicted him, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, he really did. But if, you but if you understand what the wife said, he says, why are you still trying to maintain your integrity and, and, and you know, why don't you curse God and die? Well, she spoke for the devil because she gave, she gave the, voice, the devil a voice because he says he'll curse you. Yeah. And she says, curse him. Mm -hmm. So she gave the devil a voice because of her anger and she frustration. She was, she was blaming God because 10 pregnancies and all the kids are gone. I mean, that's a lot of, that's a lot of pregnancy. I can understand her anger. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't, before you judge, judge the wife, you want to be careful on, you know, what's really happening to her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, so... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So he didn't hold these kids, ten of them, in her in his tummy. Yeah, she did. Right. You know. <laughs> yeah. Right, right, right. So yeah. So anyways, I, without all that said, I just want to say it's great to have faith in you. Everybody needs to have somebody, somebody who will have faith in them. You know. And uh, hey, John, good to see you. Good to see you. And when you understand that God has faith in you. It kind of pumps you up a little bit to know that it's not about my faith in him as much as his faith in me. Right. You know, and I like how Pastor got up there in front of the church last week and he said what I've been saying so long, like I, I've told you, I've been saying again and again, that if, if I stand in front of the church and I ask everybody, I say, how many of you want to please God? And everybody in the church would say, yeah, could I see some hands? Hands. Everybody would raise their hand, you know. And I say, okay, hands down. Now, okay, how many people you would say your number one goal is to please God? And hands, can I see hands? And hands would go up, right? Now, if I said, okay, hands down. Now, let me ask you, how many of you feel that God is pleased with you? Oh. And now no hands would go up. Oh. And you know why? Because we're sin conscious. Correct. We think God is dealing with me according to my performance. And that's why hands don't go up. But, and, and I said every hand should go up because God is not dealing with you according to your performance. He's dealing with you according to your faith. It's faith that pleases God. And that's why Pastor got up before the church in the end of the church. And I like how he, he took it to another level. He said, you, God isn't just pleased with you. He's well pleased with you. What he said to Jesus at the, at the baptism, he said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. 
right? And if you are in Christ, well, then you are in Christ. And that when God sees you, he sees Jesus. And that means he's well pleased with you. Why? How did I get into Christ? Through faith. So it's my faith that places me in the position that I have. It's, it's not performance, it's position. Thank God. Thank, yeah. <laughs> And, and, see, and that's why pa- I love the fact that he said he's not just pleased with you, he's well pleased with you, he's very pleased with you. Yeah. Didn't he say that, Pastor? Yeah. Yeah, he did. Oh, and, amen. So he just confirms what I've been saying all along. So amen to that, right? And here's something I want you to see real quick. Go to First John. I want you to see this, okay? Because I've been saying for a long time that in... in, in, in uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says that if Jesus has not risen from the dead, you would still be in your sins. Okay, but how many know that Jesus did rise from the dead? Okay, and how many know the other scriptures says if you confess Christ as Lord and believe he rose from the dead, you will be saved. Anybody heard that one? Yes. So that means that if I confess Christ as Lord and believe in my heart that he rose from the dead, I'm not in my sins. Because there's another scripture that says he was man, I was, Christ was manifested to take away your sins. That's why he came, to take them away. Another scripture says that he was in Christ, God, God, that he was, God was in Christ, not imputing your sins, reconciling you unto himself. He's not imputing them. They're not there. Now look at this. And then I found this, and this is powerful. Okay? I never saw this before. It's easy. It, it's first, first John chapter 3. Okay? Now look at this. I'll start with verse 1. It says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, that's us, now we are children of God. It has, beloved, he's calling you beloved, that means he's, he's pleased with you, he loves you, you're his child, that's what it means, beloved. Beloved, loving you, okay? Beloved, now we are children of God, it was, it, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know. Now, this is something you keep finding all through 1 John. We know, we know, we know, we know, we know. To, to several things that are all through 1 John, he constantly says, I write this so that I write this, I write this. Why is he writing this? Why is he writing this? He's telling you. I write this so, I'm, I'm, I'm writing this so you don't sin, but if you do, you have an advocate going before you. He says, I write this, children, so that you can know that your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. He says, I write this, cho- I write this so that you, you know that you have eternal life. He's calling saying, I write this, I write this, I write this, I write this. Another thing he keeps saying is, we know, we know, we know, we know. These are things, that, and, and when you see that, it's, it's good to look into what is he saying that's so important that we need to know this. Now look at this. Okay, you ready? Verse 3 says, and everyone who has this hope he purifies himself. Okay, that's where, okay. Here's the hope. And it's not if you purify yourself, you can have this hope. You see that? Mm-hmm. Everyone who has this hope that I'm a child of God, okay, and that I'm going to see him, I'm going to be like him, this is coming, this is what I am, this is who I am right now, but I got something coming that is assured, guaranteed, it's a security blanket I can wear. Okay, everybody who has that hope, you purify yourself. Okay, now watch this. You ready? Whoever commits sin, now this is why we don't see this, because it's sandwiched in between things that can get kind of scary. Okay, right? First John chapter 3. First John 3, chapter 3, verse 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and, and, and sin is lawlessness. And you know, there's another you know, that he was manifested to take away sin, and in him there is no sin. No sin. Listen, if you are in Christ, and in him there is no sin, hmm. Are you getting this? Yes. Yeah, yeah. It ties in with what I've been saying all along, that, Christ, that if Jesus had not been resurrected from the dead, we would still be in our sins. But in him there is no sin. So because of our faith in Jesus Christ, we're in Christ, and in him there's no sin. That's why a pastor could stay, that he looks at you and he's pleased with you, very pleased. Because he doesn't see, he doesn't see, he sees, your, he sees, he sees a saint who still sins. He doesn't see a sinner. He sees a saint who sins. That's beautiful, isn't it? Mm-hmm. He sees us in our spirit. That's the pill we need to swallow. Now, let, let me tell you that this is what I'm all about, okay? This is my ministry, the nature of God. I want people to see God for what he really is, okay? Now, now listen, because here's the thing. If, if, if I just met John, he just met him, and I, he's talking to me, and all of a sudden he steps away, and somebody comes up to me and says, that guy's, uh, you know, he's 
just, he's a thief, pervert. So I was telling him this stuff. Now, I might form an opinion of him, on, of him because I don't know him. I might believe these stuff. I don't even know if they're true, lies. I don't know. But I might form an opinion of him because that's what I'm being told, and I don't know him. Now, listen, if somebody told me, Carlos, now I know Carlos. If somebody says, hey, Carlos is saying these things about you, <coughs> right? Yeah. I'd say, you need to take that somewhere else. Yeah. Like, <laughs> right? If your wife says, hey, I have some things about you, you say, uh, yeah, well, uh, she, yeah if, if she did, if she did, <coughs> she, that's not, she's not. She wouldn't go there. She, that's, she wasn't thinking. You'd, you'd make an allowance for that fault, right? You know, if she, but she wouldn't. I mean, most of the problem, I don't know well enough, but you know what I mean? For the most part, you say, take that somewhere else, right? That way, it's not happening. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't believe it because you know her. And I know Carlos. And I know, you know, so, so you see what I mean? That's why it's important to know God's true nature. Right. What is he really like? And you find that, and that's all through Scripture, that he's merciful, he's kind to the unthankful and the, and the, and the wicked, the Bible says in, 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 John, in uh, uh, Luke 6, 35. It says that he is, God is, is kind to the wicked and the unthankful. He says that when he's going, touching on the Sermon on the Mount. And it says that your, his mercies are fresh every day. You mean kind to the people who are wicked, not... Who we were once. Right. Yeah. Not evil. Well, if he wasn't kind to the wicked, well, then why is Jesus going to the cross for right. the wicked? Right. 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 That's kind. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty awesome. He saved yeah. us when we were. The Bible says he died for us when we were sinners. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So it sounds pretty kind that he would do that to save us. It said as it pleased him to do it. Yeah. And that's hard under pill swaddle, though. Why would he say he's pleased to do it? You know, here, here's, the, here's, here's the thing. I got some stuff here. I got so much to say. But you know what? Here's the thing is that you wonder, like, why would it please? Carlos, he's my son, and he has cancer. And he's going to die if I don't. They say, well, you know, I don't know. I mean, we can cut off his arm. And, and he could live. I would say, please cut off the arm. Please. Save his life. That's why God could say, that's why the Bible could say that it pleased him to bruise his son. Because it was to save us. Please. Yeah. Right? So literally God wants us to come to him for everything. Oh. Really everything. Until you realize that we bring nothing to the table. We're just recipients. You, all I'm bringing to the table is my own junk. Mm -hmm. that's true. My that's sinful, true. polluted self, the needy. That's where you come. That's why the Pharisees could not come because they didn't see the need. That's right. You know, and right the problem with that is you compare. The only comparison you have is other sinners to think I'm better than. At least I don't go to jail. You know, at least <laughs> you know I'm not a terrorist. You know, I'm a pretty good guy. No, but you know the Bible says when you think you, you if you in La Church of Laodicea, he says that. Uh, uh, in, in Revelations, he says, you think you're rich, you don't need anything, you don't know, you're wretched, you're naked. That's good. Who wants okay. to hear yeah. That? Who wants to hear that? I know. That crushes a person. And until we realize that we are wretched, we are naked, then, but he says, then you they buy pure gold from me, come to me for what you need. I, he says, come unto me, all you who are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. You can relax trusting in me. Oh. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's what about. Go ahead. I, I don't want to be disrespectful, but when somebody, and you got, I, I'm not crushing you. I know you probably have a good conversation, but it's hard for me to come. Amen. Amen. Oh, amen. Sorry. Thank you. Thanks for somebody else speaking up. That's good. No, that's good. That is good. That is good. No, thank you, Peter. Because this is being recorded too, and that does kind of drown out things. So, um,. Anyway, so I want to get a picture, because I went on my hike yesterday, I, have the, I carry these little index cards, like I got this idea from Carlos, and I carry these little index cards in my pocket, and empty ones, and then I start writing little notes as I study the Word. I take my little nook device, I read the Bible as I go, I spent a nine hour hike yesterday, a nine hour, nine, nine, mile, mile. nine mile hike yesterday, <laughs> and, 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 and Rancho San Antonio, and I'm getting over a cold, and I was sick, but I didn't even notice, you know, I, I, I just wrote, it was like, sweet, and the Lord just speaks to me, and it's amazing things I've seen, I want you to... Well, let's look at some things, and I want you to see, this is the picture God wants you to have of him, okay? 
Let's go to Hosea chapter 1. This is a minor prophet. There's the major prophets, and there's the minor prophets. Right? Hosea. Oh, yeah. Hosea 1? Yeah. Chapter 1, Hosea? Yeah. A little, it's a little book, it's a short book, so it's kind of hard to find. Here it is. This is powerful. This tells you how much God wants to reach you. Okay, it says, Hosea chapter 1. It's about Hosea. It says, uh, when the, uh, verse 2, it says, When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go take yourself an adulterous wife and children of unfaithfulness because the land is guilty of the vilest adultery in departing from the Lord. So he married Gomer, daughter of Dibalim, and she conceived and bore him a son. Okay, now let's jump to verse, chapter 3. Okay, 3 1. So, okay, he's saying, hey, go marry this woman. She's going to, we don't know if it means that she was a, a woman of whore and she was actually a whore or if she was going to cheat on him. We don't really know for sure if which it was. You know, if she's a woman whoring or, or if she's going to cheat on him eventually. And I want you to carry this with, with the knowledge that she's going to cheat on you. Okay? Mm -hmm. Right? Okay, I'll so chapter 3 1. It says, The Lord said to me, Go show your love to your wife. Okay, what, what, what happens is she goes, she, she has children by him. She goes out and starts sleeping around with other men. Now he tells him, he tell, now the whole point of this, he's painting a picture for Israel. This is my love for you. It's explained a little in detail, but we're not going to go all there. I just want you to see a little taste of what's going on. Okay, chapter 3, 1, it says, The Lord said to me, Go show your love to my wife, your wife again. Though she is loved by another and is an adulteress, love her as, a love, as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. Oh, you, you picture, that's the nature of God right there. Even though, yeah. even though, Go help me out here. Go to Isaiah 54. Yeah. Oh. Isaiah chapter 54. Isaiah 54 follows 53, which 52 and 53 are very detailed about the about the, um, the sacrifice, that it's pretty detailed about Jesus, what he did, the prophecies about Jesus, what Jesus did at the cross. Many things are in there, especially 54. Detailed, detailed about, I mean 53, especially 53. Detailed, detailed about what happened to Jesus at the cross. That he was put into a rich man's tomb. Things that it was prophesied, what, what happened to him? We're not going to get in 53, but I want you to jump ahead to 54. Okay, this is, this is so important. If you, oh, this explains a lot for the believer. Because he's preaching, he starts talking about a, a, a covenant. Okay, that obviously this 54, uh, 53 is taking you into 54, which he starts to introduce a new covenant. Isn't that what Jesus brought for us? A new covenant? Yep. Didn't he do away with the old? Right. Didn't, he fulfill the, didn't he fulfill the law and, and, yes. and bring in a new covenant? Right. And about, he didn't, a lot of people say, well, didn't Jesus say I didn't, wasn't going to abolish the, the, the law? Well, yeah, he did not come to abolish, he came to fulfill it. Yeah. But if you read the new covenant, it says that law has been abolished. When he went to the cross, it was abolished. It is. You can read that. that it, it is. So people try and say, well, it wasn't abolished. Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law. He didn't do that. Well, when he went to the cross, he did. Because he fulfilled it. And then he died for it. Though he fulfilled it in living it. And he fulfilled it in dying the sacrifice for us breaking it. He did what we couldn't do in living it. And he broke the sacrifice that we have to make for, for breaking it. He did it all. Christ is, it, it's anything plus Jesus equals nothing. And, any, and, and Jesus plus nothing equals everything. You put all your faith in Jesus. So it, that's it. That's why the Bible says again and again and again, if you believe, you won't be condemned. If you believe, you will have eternal life. If you believe, believe, believe. Jesus said, these guys came and they said, what works must we do to do the works of God? And he says, this is the work. One work. They said, what works must we do to do the work of God? Plural. He says, this is the work. One. 
Believe on the one whom he sent. Amen. Mm-hmm. That's right. See? <laughs> people think that's not enough. Dude, that's it. it. That's more than enough. <laughs> Oh, look. Okay. 54 verse 4. Do not be afraid. You will not suffer shame. Now remember, this is following 53. If you want to go back and read 52, 53, and you'll see all the things that happened to Jesus on the cross. He said, this is the fulfillment of what that, this is a prophecy of that fulfillment. What this is going to get us. Verse 4 says, do not be afraid. You will not suffer shame. Do not fear disgrace. You will not be humiliated. Do you see that? 54, 4? Mm-hmm. Okay. You will, not, you will forget the shame of your youth and remember no more your approach of widowhood. For your maker, your husband. You see that? Your maker, God, is your husband. You know what that means? Yes. You know what that means yes. to me? Okay? That means to me is that uh, the Bible, God Never. frowns on divorce. Go Never. read Mal- Malachi and it says that he hates yeah. divorce. Yeah. So if God is your husband, the church is his bride. It's for life. Yeah. You're, you get yeah. married, you, you said, you know, until death do us part, right? It's for good. It's, it's solid. Mm-hmm. Solidified relationship. Can I ask something on that? Uh. I feel like it, I was thinking about this, it's funny you mentioned it, because I was thinking about this, no one can validate you but Jesus. When you seek to get married, but they don't validate you. God validates you. You're yeah. married to him. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Big so, validation, yeah. too. Yeah. 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 Okay, so let's read on. Look at this. The Holy One of God, is uh, be, uh, second half of part uh, five, it says the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He's talking about a Redeemer now. A redeemer yeah, yeah, is somebody yeah, who yeah. buys you back, pays for you, purchased. Right? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. He is called the God of all the earth. Mm-hmm. The Lord will call you back as if you were a wife deserted and distressed mm-hmm. in spirit. Didn't that, say, uh, didn't that sound kind of like Hosea a minute ago? Yeah. Mm-hmm. A wife who married young, only to be rejected, says your God. For a brief moment, I abandon you. But with deep compassion, I will bring you back. In a surge of anger, I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting kindness, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Now, look at this. It says, to me, this is like the days of Noah. I'm going to go into that in a second. When I swore that the waters of Noah will never again cover the earth. So now I've sworn not to be angry with you, never to rebuke you. Hallelujah. I've sworn never to be angry with you or rebu- never be angry. Anybody have a King James? Yes. Hear it. For is, this is as the waters of Noah unto me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth mm. with thee, nor rebuke thee. Huh. And then he goes on. He says, though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet the, my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant and peace be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. Okay. Now, uh, there's a verse in here. I'm trying to find... Okay, here it is. Verse, look at verse 14. It's going to tell you why this is going to happen, how this is going to happen. It says right here, In righteousness you will be established. You know what it means to be established? Huh? Established means secure. You're locked in. Your, your position is secure, right? And that, established. He gave us that gift of righteousness. Yeah, and that's what he says. Look what he says. He goes on and he tells you. He says, okay, look at verse 16. Uh, verse uh, 17, it says, No weapon formed against you will prevail, and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and this is their, vind- and this is their vindication from me. I like how the New King James says it. It says, because their righteousness will be of me. It's yes. going to be my righteousness, right. perfect righteousness, incorruptible righteousness. The Bible calls it the righteousness of God. That's what Paul says. He introduces that in Romans chapter 3. He starts going into this, the righteousness of God. But now, the righteousness of God is revealed. Mm. It's his righteousness. He gives it to you because you believe on Jesus Christ. You believe that he will take you, the ungodly, and, 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 the, and, and just justify you. And he takes your faith and he credits it for righteousness. You could go read that. That's in chapter 5, chapter 4. Oh. I'm so happy to be back here too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually learned stuff. You know, I love that you emphasize. I love that you emphasize that God, um, that God is our husband because um, I haven't heard that in a while. I feel like the church is always saying, like, He's our bridegroom, but that's just the beginning. Cool. Yeah. 
So, you know, we, always, we think bride, oh, we're so in love with the bride, he's the bridegroom, but that's like day one. Husband is long haul. Husband is every day. Husband is, um, and this is just coming to me too, honey. Husband is, and he walked with the Lord. He's Enoch. Mm -hmm. He walked with the Lord. That's husband. Yeah. Right? For us, we've been married longer than a nanosecond. That, <laughs> that's husband, right? Every day, walking with the Lord. So, thanks for sharing that. You know, I'm glad you said that because you know what? Uh, there, was, there was this guy, I don't know if you heard about it. it was, there was this guy over in, when we were fighting Japan over in the Philippines. There was this guy, his name was uh, Lieutenant Hiro Onida. Okay. And he was fighting the war 30 years after they surrendered, after the Japanese surrendered. And he was still fighting. And, he, and, and they dropped leaflets saying the war is over and he didn't believe it. His, 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 wow. his, his supervisor told him that, hey, you, no matter, under no condition or no term, terms, you, you surrender, you fight to the death. And all that. So he was serious about this. And finally, some guy heard about him and went over there to tell him and finally convinced him to surrender and to give up. And, but the thing is, the war was over. And he was still fighting it for 30 years. Wow. Whoa. I, I'm here to declare to you, the war with God is over. Oh. He is not your enemy. You need to get that picture in your head. We have an enemy, it's the devil. Okay. And when you sin, you have an advocate who's going to bat for you. Now, we don't want to sin. Those who have this hope purify themselves. It also says elsewhere, it says that, it, it says that, um, it says that you, it's for freedom that you've been set free, but, but don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. But there's many scriptures, there's several, there's two scriptures that say something pretty profound, and we could go there. But it actually says that all things are permissible. But not all things are beneficial. beneficial. So for the believer, anything is permissible. It is. Why? Because we're not under, between us and God, the war is over. Yeah. It's true. It says it several times. It is. It just is. You are not under law. There's no laws to keep you from doing what you want. But thank God, God blesses you with the Holy Spirit. So he works in you to will and to do what pleases him. You get a new want to. So we don't do what, whatever what I want. I do what he wants because I'm, I'm blessed. My body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. I'm, I got a new motor. I got a new motor. I'm motivated to do right. That's why I'm here going to church. That's why I don't want to just do church. I want to do Bible study. I want to get all I can get. I'm a diligent seeker. I'm a diligent seeker. And he blesses those who diligently seek him. Those who diligently seek him will find him. That's me. I want to be that. Yes. God, and you will. If you show up here, you're going to learn some stuff. Because I, I shared my testimony last week, and I've been to some crazy places. I went through Delancey Street where they took my Bible. They wouldn't let me have a Bible for a year when I was there at Delancey oh, Street. But what I can share with you last week is when I finally got my Bible. When I finally got my Bible after a year when I couldn't have it, and they're attack therapy, and they're getting in my face, and I wish I had my Bible. Oh, God, I really need a word from you. You know, I didn't, you know, I didn't have it. But when I, after a year when I could have it, oh, thank God. You know what that did for me? Ha! Oh, made me appreciate my Bible. Thank you, God. Now I don't, man, but they took it away from me for a year because I could always go to jail, go to prison, always have a Bible. That's when I went to Delancey Street. They said, no, you're not playing that here. Delancey Street is a two-year live-in program, and it's attack therapy. It's the toughest program there is. My mom knows Mimi. Yeah. yeah. Oh, she's not a criminologist. She knows, she knows that woman. Yeah. She's tough, but she's loving but I, man, and to have to hide to read it, what I shared with you, I had to hide to read my Bible. That really, boy, that, that worked on me too. Everything was working on me. Everything, but it was only because I had faith in him and I was looking to him and I wanted him and I couldn't have him and, I, and they were attacking me for trusting him and everything was working for me. What they meant for evil, God meant for my good. Oh, amen. 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 Oh. And you learn God in the hard places. You really learn him because you start to see, I start to see, man, God saw me every time, all that time I was selling drugs and all the times I turned my back on him, he never turned his back on me. All that time I was serving other gods, he was, he was still my God. I just didn't know it. Amen. He didn't cut me loose. He saw me right here doing this today. He saw this is all going to prepare you for that. I'm going to correct you. I'll discipline you. I'll work at you. 
You're, 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 you're clay. I'm shaping you. You're, you're gold being purified in the fire. Oh, you're Peter being sifted. I'll let the devil sift you. Oh, you're doing all of it. I'm a father correcting you, discipline. Yeah, he's all that. He's a father. He's a potter. He's a, the, the goldsmith go, purifying the gold. He's, he's a shepherd leading his sheep. He ain't going to leave you to yourself. He'll leave you the 99 to go get you. He's all that. You need to get a good picture of God. Yeah. He's a husband. Oh, yeah. He ain't a quitter. He, if you're yeah. faithless, yeah. he remains faithful. Yeah. And, 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 and if you're weak, his grace is sufficient because his, his, yeah. his strength shows up best in your weakness. So you think you're weak in areas? Oh, dude, that opens him up. Yeah. Oh, and he says where your sin abounds, his grace, grace abounds grace. much more. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wait a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Wait a minute. And he even yeah. says... He says if you're, here's a thought. He says if your heart condemns you, he's bigger than your heart. Yeah. Wow. You know what that means to me? That means my heart can condemn, be condemning me for things that I'm doing when God isn't. Wow. Whoa. Wow. There's no condemnation. No, no condemnation from no him. He says he will not bring a charge against his elect. That's it is him who justified you. He's justified you. You're his elect. And he won't charge you. And Jesus is interceding for you. The Bible says that he is able to save to the uttermost all those who come to God through Christ because he always lives to intercede on your behalf. You have an intercessor and you are in good shoe. You need to see it. We have a prayer meeting going on. Oh, if this don't pump you up, I don't know what will because, man, this pumps me up. Yes. Oh. You know, because of you, I was able to minister to my mom's friend. Amen. But... Is letting her sinful uh, uh, old self creep in and keep her down. And I said, stop that. Know that you are sanctified. Bam. You are loved. You are never forgotten. You can't lose your faith well, no matter what you do. And you could just see her relax a little bit. And I don't think she fully believed that because she needs more of that. She needs this Bible study. She needs a Bible study. She teaches Bible study to little kids. Oh. More so you should know that. Yeah, See, I'm glad. That, I'm glad. Thank you for the input. I want input because you lead me somewhere. Okay, this goes to the next. Okay, well, you didn't finish this because what the point is? Because if you go to the, if you go to no, I'm going to go there. Let me see where. Where was I going to go with that? So I don't forget. Okay, Corinthians, Corinthians, Corinthians. Okay, listen. Now, now, if you go to Noah, because he says this is as it was in the days of Noah. Go to Noah. Go to Genesis chapter eight. I want you to see this. Because the thing, why he's comparing this with the, with the covenant of Noah is because this is, an, uh, this is an unconditional covenant. There were conditional covenants. If you do this, I'll do this. You're blessed if you do. You curse if you don't. There are many, there are many different conditional covenants. The, the law, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, that was a conditional covenant. You're blessed if you do. You're cursed if you don't. That was conditional. He's saying this covenant is unconditional covenant. It's like the days of Noah when I promised not to flood the earth. And let's look at that covenant. Let's see what an unconditional covenant looks like. Come on now. This means no matter what you do. Because I'm going to work in you and through you. It's not going to be you, do, do, do. It's going to be working through you, you, you. <laughs> it's not going to be you. It's going to be us. <laughs> Chapter 8, can I read? Okay, uh, let, hold on, hold on. Okay, 8.15, it says, Then God said to Noah, come out of the ark. You know, for, number one thing, uh, just let you know a picture of the, this is so powerful, okay? The whole picture of the boat, and Noah was a picture of salvation. Yes. I taught on this last week yeah. Yeah. At, at the jail. And I explained, I walked through Barabbas. We can go there in a minute. Bar I walked through Barabbas and the story of Noah. I told him that we need to be, get on board with Jesus. That's what the boat, the boat, the wooden boat, the wooden cross. Okay? Noah, rest, leading the, the, whoever wanted to listen to him and go into the boat, it turned out only to be his family. Well, that represents the family of God who's following Jesus, getting on board with him. Okay, that's salvation. Now the flood represents the wrath of God that is going to be poured on on all mankind that doesn't believe. The people who don't want to get in the boat suffer. Punishment, the wrath of God. It's there, it's true, it's real, there is a hell. But it's not for the believer. The people that get in the boat, they did not, you know what, and here it is, because the Bible says we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. You know when they got in the boat, you know who closed the boat and closed the door? God closed the man. He locked them in. The Bible says, he who begins his good work in you, he will see it to completion. He's going to lock you in. You're secure in him. Genesis like, 8, 8, 15. 
Huh? Yeah. 815, it says, Then God said to Noah, Come out of the ark. You and your wife, your sons, and their wives. Bring out every kind of living creature that is with you. The birds, the animals, all the creatures that move along the ground. And they can multiply on the earth, be fruitful, and increase in number. Okay? So Noah came out with his wives and all the animals. They all came out. Verse 20 says that Noah built an altar to the Lord. Now listen, what does that represent? Jesus is our sacrifice. He says, it says, taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds. How many know there's no, none of that anymore? No more sacrificed animals. It's Jesus. Right? Okay? He sacrificed burnt offerings on it, and God smelled it, and pleasing aroma, and said in his heart, what pleases God? Your faith. His sacrifice, it said it pleased him to bruise his son. That pleased him, Jesus, the cross, right? That's, that's the pleasing aroma. Your faith in him. Okay? Never again will I curse the ground because of man. Even though, that's what my, my NIV says it like this, I love that, the even though. See, didn't we just say that about the even though with the, um, uh, what, 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 what was the verse we went, what was it? Oh, um, oh yeah, uh, Hosea, with a wife. Even though she's out there sleeping with other men. Go get her, buy her back. He bought her back, by the way. Yeah. He purchased her. That's redeem, you redeem, he bought you back. That's what God does for us, he buys you back. The Bible says you were bought for a price, you're no longer your own. Okay, now look. Oh my gosh. Okay. Never even though every inclination of his heart is evil from childhood, and never again will I destroy living creatures as I have done. So he's promising, this is his covenant he's making with Noah never to flood the earth. And he says, even though these guys are evil, even though your inclination of your heart, even though the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, who can even know how bad it is? He said, even though, even though their righteousness is filthy rags, he's comparing 54, covenant, Jesus brings, 53, mm. Jesus, death, 54, covenant, from that death that brings to us, and for those who believe, get, get this covenant that he's not angry with you, he would never, he, and it's an unconditional covenant, as it was with Noah in that day, he's comparing, oh my gosh, dude, this is powerful, okay, now, <laughs> oh man, Whew. You could look at Jonah and look at Jonah and look at the Nineveh. You didn't want to destroy them. He said, I'm going to destroy them. But wait a minute. Let me send Jonah to these guys. Look at these are Nineveh. These are longtime enemies of Israel. Right, right, right. And they were corrupt. If you know some of the things that they do, it's crazy. These guys were bad, bad, bad. And he didn't want to destroy them. He sent Jonah to convince them to, to, to repent. He didn't want to wipe them out. Jonah didn't want to go. Jonah was yeah, upset. Was when he was relented and didn't punish them, he, wh he whined and sniveled because, oh, man, oh, man, nothing happened. Uh, and people wonder, what was that all about? I think that was because he's thinking, like, man, what, now I go there, I preach to these guys. I tell them, you know, if you repent, you know, God, in 40 days, you're going to die. In 40, I mean, you, you know, you, you, you know, you, you repent. And they, they listened. They repented. Now he's thinking, they're going to think I, I was lying. What do I know? You know, they're going to think I was, you know, because nothing, ha nothing happened. And he was kind of hoping it would happen because then it would show him to be a real prophet. Look, I warned you, bam, happened, just like I said, but it didn't happen. Now he's thinking, oh, how do I look now? Poor me. That's what he did. He went and sulked. Poor me. You know what that's interesting is you put the prodigal son story next to that story, you'll see so many, so many similarities. Put the read Jonah alongside a prodigal son and how he sulked at the end. He was angry that they didn't get punished. That's the prodigal son's brother. He was angry because he should be punishing him. He should be rejecting him. But he was, you know, it, it, it's the similarities. And even how they both taper off. We, they don't end. It's like, okay, what happened? Did Jonah finally get it? You know, because God's pleading with him. You don't care about those people. I, I care about them. And their animals. All those people, you know, you're sniffling about this little vine that died and shriveled. And you don't care about all those yeah. thousands of people. And he says, I care. Mm. You know, and that's the prodigal son story. He's pleading with the brother. You don't care about your brother? I care. In the both stories, they taper off. Interesting, huh? Yeah. Oh, boy. The Bible is fun to study. I, find, I have fun reading my Bible. What's next? Oh, man. <laughs> Somebody get excited. <laughs> okay, thank you, Dylan. Corinthians. If this doesn't help you, I don't know what will. But Corinthians. <laughs> and then he's good. <laughs> he's your Ananias. He is. Dylan's solid, man. This guy, this brother, I love this guy. He's got the biggest heart. Hallelujah. First Corinthians. 
My mom adopted him. He's my, he's my brother. My mom adopted him, by the way. Oh, wow. <laughs> brother from the same mother. <laughs> so anyways. What chapter? Dylan shared with him some of his struggles, the stuff he had. I does not connect with his, parent, his family very well. My mom says, okay, well, you're my son. I adopt you. <laughs> okay, so here it goes. Ready? Okay. Okay, first Corinthians, go to chapter one. Let me let me where, where's my little Bible? There it is. Okay, now this is powerful. To understand Corinthians, if you understand Corinthians, Corinthians was a messed up church. They were sinning, sinning, sinning. There were all kinds of bad things going on there. They were defiling the Lord's table. They were going to be, they were showboating, t- uh, spiritual gifts, namely tongues. He talks for three chapters about tongues because that apparently, for him to go so long about tongues, it must have been a pretty big deal in that church. Okay, he's made, you know, and, and, and uh, yeah, and, and, yeah, and so, uh, He's, he's going after the sexual things going on Prophecy. in the church. They're causing divisions. Oh, yeah. They're making a big deal yeah, about yeah. who's the better preacher. You know, all this stuff. It's like, you know. Teachers. Yeah, and, and so there, you know, there's, there's all kinds of problems in that church. Yeah, yeah. Okay? Right. Now, um, I want you to see at the end of each chapter. Oh, my God. This is so good. Which okay? Which chapter? Every chapter. Uh, it's still 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I want you to see something. Go to the end of 1 Corinthians because he's correcting stuff. He's, he's talking to him. Um, uh, at the end of chapter 1, he says, uh, 29 says that no flesh should... Okay, let me see. Uh, verse 27. But God has chosen the foolish things in the world to put, put to shame the wise. Now, now, now here's something you've got to understand. God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Well, he, say, say that again. he does not call, the, he's not looking for qualified, there aren't any, okay, but he call, he's, he qualifies the call, so, so what he does, okay, this is, it, this is it, he calls you, you obey, and he, he qualifies you along the way, he calls you, you obey, he qualifies you along the way, I can call, I can contest to that, okay, because he didn't know, I, he was getting it, he had his hands full with me, Okay, he didn't. I, he didn't. I, he, I guess he knew what he was getting into. Right. Right. Mr. Backslide and Henry turned my back on him. I go. Because on. he knows that he who has sinned much, you know. Oh! Yes. Oh wow! Yeah. Those were those were forgiven much, love yeah. much. Yeah. How much yeah. are you forgiven? Too much. Too much. Too much. Wait. It, it's now it's you can. Lo- now you're free to love him too much. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. you realize just how much he's done for oh. you. Oh. He calls you, you obey, he qualifies you along the way. He's not call, he doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. He calls you, you obey, he qualifies you along the way. Yes, mm. I like that. He qualifies you, obey. He calls you, obey. <laughs> Are you glad you came, John? Yes. <laughs> I just see stunned. He's like, he's like, mouth is hanging. His mouth is hanging down. <laughs> well, that's what he's saying. He hasn't chosen the foolish. He says, he says God has chosen the foolish things, but to shame the wise. Uh, uh, now look at this. Let's go back to 26. It's for you see your calling, verse 26, 126. You see your calling, brethren. Not many. Now he says, not many. Okay, because there are some that are wise. Okay, but he says, not many are wise according to the flesh. Right. Not many mighty, okay, so there are some mighty, okay, there are some that come to the Lord, and they're, they're, they're pretty, you know, they're right, okay, not many noble are called, but God, okay, that, I love, that's one of my favorite verses in the Bible right there, but God, okay, but God, I highlight that everywhere I see a but God, I highlight that, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak of the world to shame the things which are mighty, the base things, that's the lower things, of the world, and the things which are despised. God has chosen. That's me. I was despised. The cops hated me. The judges were through with me. They wanted to throw the book at me. But God stepped in and did something for me. And the things that are not... Uh, holy. Amen. <laughs> Amen. He, he God's got a bigger book than any book the yeah. judges got. Yeah, the book of life. <laughs> book of life. He's, he, he had my name written in the book of life, and it wasn't going anywhere. Henry, now you're <laughs> He's going to see to that. Now you're going to uh, the book back at us. You're going to love it. Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, now it's it. Now, let, where I'm going is heavy, okay? You guys, this is going to wake you up right now, okay? This is going to be a wake-up call, okay? okay? So he says um, in, in verse 29 that no flesh could glory in his presence, right? Right, right? But to him, you now look at this. This is a Corinthian church. He's about to go at length at correcting all these things that are wrong with him. And look what he says to them. Look what he says. But of him, you are in Christ. These sinners... He even calls them carnal Christians, worldly Christians. He says that. We're going to get there in a second. He calls them worldly Christians. You're sinners. You're sinning. And, and you're Christians. Oh, he says, but you are in Christ. That's one thing you're going to see at, every, at the end of each chapter. Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 6. He, after correcting them, telling them what's wrong in the church, you know, he ends it saying, your identity. You're in Christ. We don't do that. Yep. Don't do it. Mm -hmm. But you're in. You're not going out. I ain't letting you go out. Hey, remember a question. Hey, huh? I, hate to bug you. I have a question. How are you defining worldly Christian? Just somebody who's acting like the world. It's hard to tell they're Christian because they're doing stuff that the world does. You can see it. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to tell they're in Christian. Mm -hmm. So that means they're double minded. Yeah. Huh? It means that they're double minded, they're unstable. Yeah, well, you know, they're just, you know, they might. Kind of guy who says, you're a Christian? Oh. 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 Yeah, right. Oh, oh okay, oh. I get it. Yeah, if you brought on if you were brought on trial, they, they, they wouldn't yeah. if you were brought brought on trial for yeah. being a Christian, yeah. 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 they wouldn't have enough evidence yeah. against you to prove it. Yeah. Because yeah. you're you're claiming it, but you're not really. I mean, yeah, well, you're not there's not no evidence yeah. to show it. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh, you know? Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it don't mean you're not. It right. just means yeah. you need to yeah. grow some. Right. Not with your mouth. Yeah, it, do, it doesn't mean you're not Christian. Yeah. It just means you need to grow some because a lot of us come in like that. I did. Yeah. 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 I was in I, I came to the Lord in jail and I was serious. I saw miracles and I was, you know, I man. You know, and I got I, I got saved in jail. But I, I was I was hardcore. I was a mess. I needed help. I needed something like Delancey Street, and I wasn't ready to go there yet. So I had to fall a few times. Which, which yeah. a newborn child when they're starting to walk or starting, to, yeah. they fall too. You know, yeah. that's what it is. They fall. But but the thing is, is as we grow up in our natural life, mm -hmm. we fall less. We stumble less. Mm -hmm. And so if you are older in Christ, but you keep stumbling. You gotta wonder mm -hmm. what's going on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What they, kind of thing? Yeah. Where why are you not growing up properly? Yeah. What is yeah. this disability that you've got yeah. that continues to cause you to stumble? Right. Mm. Wow. Because when was last time any of you physically really fell? You know. Wow. But you see a child when they're learning to walk, they're falling. Away. Yeah. Wow. See, that's good. That's so good. The change. Yeah, yeah. That's important. The change is, is what you're teaching, yes. which is that we're already yes. sanctified. He doesn't love us any less than exactly. his pure and the, love. And that's what he's doing to the Corinthian church. Yeah. He's yeah. reminding them who they are to kind of get them back on board. I mean, so to get them, you know, get them, they're not, they're not off out of Christ. They're not, they're still in Christ, which is you're not acting like it. You're acting carnal. So, so let's get you back on board. See who you really are. Right. But, but also bringing it back, when we have that small child <laughs> that keeps falling, we don't say, you're an idiot. I'm yeah. done with you. You haven't figured this out yet. Wow. We say, no, no, come on, get up. You can do it. Come on. And you're cheering them on. Come to daddy. Come to mommy. You can. Come on. And you encourage them to get back up. Get back in the game. That's what God's doing, too. But you, you do start wondering, you know, what? What's called, you know, why are you weak? You know, why are your legs weak? Why, you know, we got to get you stronger so you yeah. can stand up. You should not see a 20 year old crawling around. Yeah. 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 Exactly. See, that's the thing. That's what I love the way that the Bible, I, I love the way that the Bible expresses itself. It says to, that we, we are being led by the Spirit, we are to walk in the Spirit. Oh, but but, he, but exactly what I was gonna say. yeah, we're to walk, walk in the spirit. In the spirit. Now, now, a little baby comes out of the womb. He doesn't just come out and just all of a sudden, you know, at one, two, three, start jogging and dancing and doing marathons. That'll come. But he's got to learn to walk in the spirit. It's a, it's a. You don't learn. You don't learn to walk. One day you're going to be dancing and marathoning it in the spirit. You know. But yeah, come on. But that'll come. I'm not promoting him, but he has some insight. There's a brother named Watchman Nee. Have you heard? Mm -hmm. Watchman Nee. Yeah, yeah. He has a very powerful book. <laughs> and it's called Sit, Walk, and Stand. And so we begin by sitting in the heavenly. We have to know where we are. Yeah. This is, what, this is your whole thing, right, Henry? But then we can walk. 
and then stand is fighting. It's like the battle. Amen. So that's like Ephesians, sit, walk, and stand. Yeah. Mm. Well, it's mm. like I tell, like I say, we're, we're just branches, you know, but we're connected right. to the vine and the branches. The fruit is going to come because of that connection. The, the, the thing is, do I realize how connected I am? Do I know where I stand, mm. what I'm connected to? Mm. Where, where, you know, because that's how it's going to come. You don't have to force it. You don't have to make it happen. Wow. Just so, it's just part of the process. If you're really a branch, you've got to see yourself a branch connected to Christ, right. one with him, right. just like a branch is one with the tree, yeah. and, and the fruit will come. You don't have to force it. You're not going to make that happen. That's the problem. You know? And, and it's good to be in fellowship because that's how I found out my gift. I didn't know I was a teacher. I was at our church before I came here. And people would come to me and they say, they tell me, uh, you should be involved with teaching or something because you always have something good to bring to the table in our Bible studies. And you should be involved. Maybe you, maybe you should, because you're great with the kids. Maybe you should be teaching these kids, you know, because these kids, they love you. You know, and, and well, you should be getting involved in teaching them or something, because they need, and, and they did. I was next thing, you know, they put me in, in youth ministry, and I started teaching the teenagers. It was awesome, because there were these kids, they would come, and, and one of these kids would come, and, and he brought, he brought his, uh, oh, man, I, boy, this is heavy. I got to tell you this, okay? There, there, was, there, there, there was this one kid, his, uh, his name is Josh, and he was bringing this, his friend to the Bible study. I mean, no, wait a minute, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the friend Josh, he comes to me, he tells me he's got this friend, and he's an atheist, and he doesn't know how to talk to him. How would I talk to him, you know? And I told him, well, you know, I don't know, you know, we, we, I prayed with him about it. But a week later, his mom invited me to go to this fair across the bay with them. And so his mom, Josh, and his little sister sat in the back seat, and he brought his friend. He said, he took me aside, he says, hey, that friend of mine, the atheist, that's him, so be careful what you say about God, okay? So he kind of warned me. You know what I'm <laughs> so he, 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 sat, he sat in the front with me, the, the friend, and, and he, I sat in the back. And so I'm driving on the way, and I, started, I just started telling him, I said, hey, you should come to our Bible studies. You know, we have, a, you know, donuts, and, you know, it's a lot of fun coming over there. He says, yeah, yeah maybe, you know. Uh, I says, you know what, I'll tell you, you know, a lot of people don't, you know, they, they don't have, uh, a lot of people don't, uh, like God or they don't believe in God because they just got a wrong impression of God. You know, they don't, they don't know him. If they knew him, they'd want to know him more. You know, they'd, they'd fall in love with him when they knew how much he loved, it, he loved them. And I start, started from, on the, dri on the drive, I just started showing him the story of the prodigal son. I walked through, him, walked through it with him and expounding on it and I was talking about it. When we got across the bay, Josh came to me later and he says, you know what, I don't know what you said to him, He's not an atheist anymore. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? And they came. He came to my next Bible study wow. with him, with yeah. Josh. He came with him. And then get this. My Bible study was about six kids, you know, usually about six teenagers, and, and including Josh. But then he brought his friend, and then they brought their friends. And he would, I would have 12 kids in there, and half of them would be Josh and his friends. They, I, he brought him. They started bringing them. And half my class was all joking. And Josh used to come in with all his friends. Yeah, they come by hearing hearing I'm hearing telling you, and, and that's because you don't have the picture. You don't understand. You don't know him. You know, if you don't know him, you're going to be scared of him. When the Bible says we should have the perfect love, should have no fear. Right? Yeah. Perfect love should have no fear. A uh, uh, perfect love should have no fear. Now, and it's interesting. It says the perfect love should have no fear. Now, look. It says perfect love should have no fear. If love perfected in you, you should have no fear of punishment because... If you fear punishment, you're not perfected in love. But then it says, we love him because he first loved us. That's telling you, what, you wonder, what is that perfect love? The perfect, and he tells you at the end. He says, because we love, be, love him because he first loved us. That's the perfect love. His love, for me, gets mine. And if you get that, that's where love is perfected in you. I get it. It's your love. Gets mine. I don't have it to give. Amen. I got to be a recipient to even give it. Yeah. I don't have yeah. it. Yeah. And who doesn't want to be loved? Oh! Right. <laughs> now that, oh boy. Okay, so verse 30, it says, but of him you are in Christ. 1 Corinthians 1, 30, it says, but of him you are in Christ, Amen. who was meant. Now, what did we see earlier? That if, you know, if there is no sin in him. Yeah. 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 And he's telling these sinners, Corinthian sinner, well, you're going to see in a minute, there's a lot of sin in this church. <laughs> This church was messed up. And he's telling them, you are in Christ. And in him, there's no sin. Wow. wow. You see how you connect the dots? It's like a puzzle. Who has made unto us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption? 
In him, you righteousness, sanctification, redemption. You're, it's all in him. Mm. Now, verse 2, you go to chapter 2. Okay, there's a lot of stuff in here, but we're running out of time. Look how he ends chapter 2. He says, verse 16, he says, um, it says, for verse 16, 2, 16, it says, For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Amen. He's telling yeah. this to the sinful Corinthians. Wow. Right. Are you getting me? Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like identity is everything. Yeah. Even when you sin, what does God do? Oh, you sinner, conviction. Ah, no, he's reminding you of your identity. You're a Christian. We don't do that. Yeah. Loving him. Guilty! Yeah. No, Satan's the accuser of the yeah. brethren. He's the one putting guilt on you, guilt yeah. tripping, yeah. making you feel yeah. feel like God is yeah. not, don't want to talk to you. He right. not got nothing for you. Yeah. That's the devil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Bible says if your heart condemns you, he's bigger than that. Yeah. Who? Mm -hmm. cool. wow. Now, sure, we should feel uncomfortable with sin. Of course, we should hate sin. God hates sin. Of course, the Bible says don't grieve the Holy Spirit. It's don't grieve. We don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. That's my spirit that's grieved. There's not some spirit out there somewhere. It's me. That's me feeling uncomfortable with sin. Because my spirit is grieved. That's the Holy Spirit. He says, don't grieve him. And I do when I sin. Not conviction. Guilty. The Bible, only place, the Bible, biblically, biblically, the only place where the Bible talks about conviction of sin, it says the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he will convict the world of sin. And he says, of sin, because they believe not in me. It's unbelief. That's, right, that's, true. that's the yeah. biblical conviction. Yeah, okay. Now me, I'm big on that because I was a convict. <laughs> I didn't like that word. It's an uncomfortable word for me. And I, I, don't, I don't blame it because the Bible says no, there's no condemnation for those in Christ. And if you go look at the word condemnation, one of the words that come up is convict. Yeah. Huh. Why are we throwing that word around? When, especially when biblically it's not even used that way. I'm just throwing some stuff out. You can take this for whatever. This is my opinion. This is, you know, I just, hey, man, I just wonder when they, when you see one, one verse and they make a doctrine around it, yeah. I question it. Yeah. Amen. When it's not supported elsewhere in the New Testament, like, you know, yeah. it, you, the Bible says test the spirits, see if they even yes. be of God, for there are yes. many false yes. prophets gone out of the world. That means there's a lot of false oh. teachings, man, and if that was written oh. back then, many, I'm telling you, it's many, <laughs> many, 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 many now. Ooh. Yeah. And it says to test everything and cling to what is good. That's test everything. Nice. We're supposed yeah. to be testing it and yeah. seeing if it's yeah. true. Right. I have a whole list. I did this this morning. I got so many things here, and we're done. But you know, I want. There's, there's, there's. The Bible says that that God took kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden because he couldn't bear to look at them. Because the Bible says that uh, his eyes are too holy that he can't look upon sin. Right? Okay. Henry, I think you need more than one. I know. Yeah, you know yeah. I'm just saying. After the first Dude, I, I hear you. Don't make me get up in here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Look at this. I'll get up. Well, daylight saving time is coming. I'm not an early person. Daylight saving time is coming. I didn't finish. I'll get up. I didn't even finish with 1 Corinthians. You get my point on 1 Corinthians, though, because I'm going to go somewhere else right now. But you see what I'm saying? First, you can look at chapter three. Chapter three, it calls them carnal. And at the end of chapter three, he says, "Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit." Yep. So he's calling them carnal Christians in chapter three. And he ends chapter three with saying, "Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit." So he's calling them carnal Christians, but he's reminding them of who you are. Yeah. Are you getting me now? Yeah. Yeah. And you could go ahead and you can check it out for yourself. But that's powerful. Oh, you don't hear that preached. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So listen, he says, your eyes are too holy to look upon sin in Habakkuk 1.13. But you know, uh, that might be 1.3. I think I might have that wrong. But I think it's Habakkuk 1.3 or 1.13. But he says, your eyes are too holy to look upon sin. So people say, oh, that, that's why God turned his back on Jesus at the cross. He turned his back on Jesus because he can't bear to look at sin. Right? That's why he cast Adam and Eve out of the garden because he can't bear to look at sin. Get out of there. The Bible says he cast them out of the garden of Eden so that he wouldn't eat from the tree of eternal life. That's why. So that he wouldn't live forever in a sinful state. How would it feel to have cancer and it's eating away your body and you yeah. never die? How would it feel to be, have every Hitler live forever? Every, oh. you know, oh, just, just live in sin forever. 
Okay, he, that, that's why he kicked them out of the garden. So in the sinful condition, they don't live forever eating from the tree of eternal life. That's why he did it. It's not because he couldn't bear to look at them. He's still dialoguing with them. He's still talking with them. He's still blessing them. She says, I'm blessed. The, the, father, the Lord has blessed me with a child. He's, she still saw herself being blessed by him. So he didn't kick them out of the because I can't bear to look at you. Now, now look at that scripture at Habakkuk. It says that he, he, his eyes are too holy to look upon sin. It actually says your eyes are too holy to look upon sin. Why do you look at it and not do something? Read it. <clears throat> One minute he says you can't look, but he says you do. <clears throat> what it's saying is your eyes are too holy that you cannot look upon sin with pleasure. Amen. Oh. Why do you look at it and not do something about it? Rejected. See, see why when people and, and what about the cross? Well, we looked at the cross and people say, well, he didn't return his back on Jesus. Well, if you go look at the Bible, you can go. I go. I, this is what I do. I test. I went to that scripture where he actually said, "My God, My God, why have you forsaken me?" Yeah, yeah. Okay, we, we should look at it so you guys can see what I'm talking about. We're almost out of time. One, one thirteen. One thirteen. Yeah, one thirteen. One thirteen. Yeah. yeah, look at it. Look at it in the King James because that's where it actually uses look, look. Why do you look? Well, why, how, you can't look. Why do you look? <laughs> Wait a minute. And that God would have to be a wear blindfold. Je Jesus would have to go around. Jesus would have to be blind. He can look at sin. He can see it. He's just not affected by it like we think he is. He's, a, he's not affected by sin the way we think he is. He sees you have cancer. He sees you, you're my son. You have cancer. Do I hate you for having cancer? Jesus said it's a sick who need a doctor. He's come to call sinners to repentance. Now, he equates sin with a sickness. Now, if you have cancer and, and you're going to die, I, I, do I hate you for having you went and got cancer, Rich? <laughs> no, I, I love you. I hate the cancer. Matter of fact, if you didn't have cancer, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hate the cancer. You don't have it. I hate you because you have it. I mean, I hate the cancer because you have it. I, my, a matter of fact, my love for you is equivalent to the hatred of cancer. Well, that's sin. His love for you is equivalent to his hatred of sin. Mm -hmm. Who? Are, are you feeling me? <laughs> That's a perspective that we need to have. Mm -hmm. Wrap us up here. Okay, well, let, let me finish with this because I want you to see this because the Bible says Psalm 22, 24. You, somebody go there, Psalm 22, 24. It says, okay, because people say, if you heard this, God turned his back on Jesus, so he won't turn his back on you. Have you heard that? You've heard that, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, that's the chapter, Psalm 22 is a chapter where it says that, um, that my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so I read that to see what is really happening there, what is being said, what is, what is going on to see, because here's the thing, it didn't sit right with me saying that God turns his back on you, to be teaching that to new covenant believers, that God is a turn his back kind of God. It just didn't sit right with me. So I wanted, and then I thought, well, that doesn't really say that, and I don't really see anywhere it's saying that. Let me go to that chapter 22 and see what it says. And, and, and somebody hit me with, somebody hit me with yeah. Psalm 22, 24, and look what it says. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. No, that's not it. No. For he Psalm 22. Not, for he hath not despised. Psalm 22, 24. Oh, it was just two, two verses. Go ahead. For he has not despised nor abhorred the afflicted of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face. Bam! <laughs> he has not hidden his face from him. No. But he heard every cry. Right. Right. He didn't turn his back on him. You know what happened? Jesus tasted what we would taste. He went through what we would go through. He felt rejected so you will never be rejected. It's not God turning his back on him. The Bible says he didn't do that. That's why you got to test stuff. That's why you got to see what the Bible really says. Mm. Because God is not a turn his back kind of God. <laughs> he didn't know covenant. There were places where it says that he turned his face away from people and things like that. But you shouldn't be preaching that kind of stuff in the new covenant believer. Even doing it to Jesus. You, because when the Bible says that he didn't do that to Jesus. He didn't turn his back on him. And I got a whole list of those things to look at from that. But, but you know what? That's a whole other you know, Bible study. <laughs> Interesting, huh? Right? That's why yeah. we got to, you know, it's good to know the truth. Because if you really know the truth, it should set you free. There should be some freedom. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Which one?
there. Father God, I just I thank you for my brothers and my sisters and I, their hunger that you're just you say that in you that we never hunger and we never thirst. So Father God, we find we find our fill in you, Father God. So we thank you that you provided yourself in every way for us to be just consumed with you and be and find our peace in that place. Amen. So Father God, we just thank you. We can't say enough, Father God. Amen and amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. Amen.